We are going to be in Luke 24, and, um, and so I'm going to go ahead and read the text of 12 verses. I would ask you to stand, but that would be dumb, but you can if you want. <laughs> in Luke 24, starting with verse 1, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning... There are, there are certain other women with them. They and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and, and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened." Lord, thank you for your word, and we just ask that you speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, we have the account here. The, um, you know, each gospel writer, you know, times four, what they do is uh, they have different angles of the resurrection account. And uh, although we're mainly going to stick with the account here in Luke, there are varying details uh, of the account, never contradictions of one another, but just verifications uh, of a true testimony. And so we see here in the first verse that it says, now on the first day of the week. So this was Sunday, and this is why Christians will celebrate on Sundays, we'll get together. It's the, you notice it says it's the first day of the week. So it's not ending our week, but it's beginning our week. And so, um, and so at the first day of the week, very early in the morning. So this was at the break of day. Um, hunters call this uh, shooting light. <laughs> A half an hour before sunrise. You know, with a good scope, you're dialed. But anyway, so this is very early in the morning. They and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And so these women came, um, like we would bring flowers, they brought spices and they had planned to anoint the body. And uh, the Gospel of Mark adds a detail in the 16th um, chapter. Uh, it says, very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? And so that added details is saying that, uh, you know, they had um, um, really were concerned how that stone was going to be moved because the stone was very large. And uh, yet as things began to unfold, it wasn't a problem. It turned out not to be a problem at all. And, and so that's true like so many things that we would worry about. Uh, it turns out that God takes care of them. And so, like in our lives, as in these women here, as they started their morning off, is God looks for initiative. 
And when we'll take the initiative in faith, it's a principle of scripture, then God provides. Where God guides, God provides, but often the, init the in in initial steps we take is by faith saying, I don't know how this is going to work, but I believe this is what God wants. And so it happened for the women. And, um, and so once again, this is at first light and Jesus had already risen. Uh, the, the gospel of Matthew gives us a detail in Matthew 28, where it says now after the Sabbath, first day of the week began to dawn Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb and behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And so uh, that gives an account of uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary together coming to the tomb. And that's when there was an earthquake. And that's when, uh, you know, it, it speaks of the, the, the stone being rolled back and um, the angel of the Lord descending. And so the Marys apparently there before the other women, and there's that sequence of time of events that each gospel will give you that different snapshot. And so that's the snapshot we get as the angel came down and moved the stone and and, um, and so we know that it wasn't, the stone was not moved so that Jesus would be able to get out of the tomb, but the, um, the stone was moved so that the disciples could go into the empty tomb as the women did. And so they were able to, to, look, to look in. And, and of course, um, that's the, the biggest part of our faith is to know that the disciples, the eyewitnesses could look into the tomb and see that it was empty and then give the great testimony of the tomb being empty. In an application, we know that God does remove those barriers that would otherwise keep us from seeing what is true. You know, the Bible tells us that you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And so, um, God is not God who hides himself. You know, God is God who reveals himself for all those who would genuinely be seeking after the Lord. I remember uh, my pastor when I was down in Southern California, Pastor John Duncan down in Lake Elsinore. And, and I remember him. He said he grew up in a, a, a non-Christian home, but they had Christian neighbors. And he was always under the impression that God was an angry God who always wanted to judge and that people were, were holding on to the greats over flames of hell as God would be trying to shake them off into the fires of hell. And that's the image he had as a kid. You know, God is not that way at all. God is a loving God. God uh, wants to reveal himself. God doesn't want to make it difficult for anyone. God just is asking us to seek him in truth. And so we seek him and then he reveals himself for he is truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so uh, then in verse three, notice then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And so they, they go in and um, and the tomb, as uh, their intentions were to, to go ahead and put the spices on his body. Well, there was no body. And, um, you know, there, there was a couple of us, a group of us that went, um, it's been, a, what, a year and a half now or so, where we went to the tomb. And it's a large tomb where, you know, you know several of us could go in there at one time. And so uh, we're able to see this, this tomb and we really believing this is the tomb and location to where Jesus would have been crucified and the whole business and the descript description uh, where it was at. And so uh, it is, uh, you know, kind of amazing to think that this was the place, the scene where these women walked in and there was no body there as they're, 
you know, looking for him. And, and although uh, Jesus had said three times, three separate occasions, he told them that, um, that this would happen. Still, they did not believe. You notice it says that they were looking, and what happened there in verse 4 is, is they were greatly perplexed about this, that, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. So here they are, uh, meaning they had uh, doubt. They, there was hesitation. And, um, and in, uh, as things begin to, you know, uh, go through their, th- their thinking processes, they'd be thinking of every other scenario other than the fact that he was alive. They'd be thinking somebody stole it. What, ha- what happened to his body? But not that Jesus had risen. And while, while they're perplexed, which means they're just really puzzled, and as they're starting to think through this, Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. It's the idea of like, you know, poof. They just, no warning. And then, and then these, these two men just, you know, materialize in front of them. And, um, and so they were, it was the perfect, uh, you know, scare, you might say. Uh, when we were kids, we used to love to do that. Catch somebody off guard that's not expecting him and then jump out. And then they just freak out. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, I personally see the, the humor in it. Because, you know, God could have easily had them to materialize outside the tomb and say, excuse me, coming in. A little bit of a warning here. But, no, it didn't happen that way. Uh, it's funny because on Wednesday morning we have the men's prayer group. And uh, Hank gets here about 5 o'clock uh, before anybody else. And then he starts cleaning downstairs. He's always, you know, cleaning the cafeterias up. And I get here about 5.15. So when I get here, he's down there working. And, and this haven't ha- hasn't happened for a while because now I give him a heads up. But he's really into his work. And then I'll kind of walk up right next to him and go, hey, Hank. And he'll just practically jump out of his skin. And a couple of times his fist came up. And he was about to, you know, give me a right hook. And finally I go, oh, man, I better not do this, you know, because, um, you know, for my own safety. So now I'll make noise. Hey, Hank, I'll yell from the top of the stairs. Get, I don't want to get knocked out. But anyway, so, uh, but that was the scene. And so these women, these women were shocked as it says there, these two men are in shining garments. So they're, they're not mere humans, these two men. And, um, and so you might say their words are, how come so much gloom at the tomb? That's not their exact words, but. So why are you looking in a tomb for someone who is alive? This is basically uh, their questioning. And people will make that mistake, looking for the living God, God in dead religions of men, amidst graveyards of dead belief systems. Instead of reading the Bible, which it says, the Bible says of itself, it's the, living, it's the living word. You know, the message of the Bible is not, among dead literature, it tells us in he, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. A discerner. In other words, because it's living, it's not just like any other literature. It's living. It's a discerner because it's by the Spirit of God. It's God's Word. I often heard say, if you want to hear God speak audibly, read the Word out loud. So this is the living Word given by God to us as His discerner. It speaks of that personal interaction that we have with the Spirit of God. That's the nature of the Word of God. It's truth. And by application, uh, the Word, the counsel comes through hand-tailored for us. So when we spend time with it, it's a directive. It has power to change lives. It has power to direct us. It has power to take us from hopelessness to hope, um, from death to life. And so this isn't just literature. This is the word of God. It's living. It's powerful. And so, and uh, Jesus says of himself, you know, uh, it says that, that Jesus is the word. He's, he's the word incarnate. You know, in the beginning was the word. The word was with 
God and the Word was God. And then further down in John chapter 1, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so Jesus is the Word. He has risen. He's alive. And he's alive today, working through his Word and through faith. And so that's what the Bible declares of the Word. And so um, these uh, angels come declaring the word of God, reminding the disciples of what was said, because believing that is going to make all the difference for them. And that's why the word was previous to these things that they could read and then understand, because this is supernatural. This is stuff that people just don't expect or believe. And then in verse 5, it says, Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Again, startled, frightened, and again, you know, it's the very thing that separates religions of the world. You're seeking the living among the dead. And this statement would uh, not initially compute with them. And so, you know, we're, our, our Lord is no longer in the grave, unlike other religions. You know, they believe in, in, in those that their bodies are still in the grave. And he is not here, they said, but in verse 6, he is, um, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified the third day and rise again? And so they say he is risen. And these words that have thrilled the hearts of believers from the first resurrection morning. People would hear of the resurrection for the first time. And, and may um, not believe it like these disciples. And so, you know, you share the resurrection, it may not be believable. It takes the Holy Spirit, it takes the word of God, it takes the genuine seeker to come to that place where suddenly the message is believed. The, the disciples acted in a couple different ways. Um, they displayed a couple different responses. One being is when they first heard it, it heard it, it sounded like it was just a fairy tale. Like these are this is just a fairy tale. How can we believe something like this? And Peter, he checked out the facts. But he remained puzzled and, and really a skeptic. And so, you know, we have that, um, that account in the Gospel of John in chapter 20. I'd like to read it, just uh, two verses where it says, um, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. And so um, actually that's the, that's, the, that's the verse I wanted to share. Although Peter did go check it out, remained a skeptic. But here, what I wanted to mention was the women. The angel said, why are you looking for him? Remember, he is risen. Remember what he spoke to you. And yet, when they went and reported to the disciples, what was their word to the disciples? They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So as although the apostles would say, he is risen, just like he said. They said, no, they've stole them, and we don't know where they put them. And so the report didn't come as the angel had given it to them. So they weren't sure what to do. I mean, obviously they weren't thinking, wait a minute, he's alive again. And it's puzzling because, because they, they, they witnessed uh, Lazarus being raised from the dead and where he was dead and he was alive. What do they think of that? They think maybe he wasn't dead and he became alive. They had all these questions stirring around. Meanwhile, they were genuine, uh, genuine believers, genuine disciples. And so as Peter would main, remain a skeptic, the women also. And then also, it wasn't until they encountered personally the risen Lord that they believed. For the most part, um, 
John, when he looked into the tomb and what he saw there, he believed. Um, but as the disciples would meet and encounter the risen Lord, then they would come to faith. And then Jesus, what Jesus has to say about that is he says, blessed are those who have not seen and believed. He said that to Thomas. But Thomas wouldn't believe until Jesus said to him, here, put your hand into my side. You know, you know, look at the, look at the wounds. Put your, put your finger in, my, in my, my wounds, Jesus said to Thomas. And then he, said, he says, oh, my Lord and my God. And he said to Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and believe. And so, you know, they, as they encountered him, then they, they accepted the fact of the resurrection. Then as they committed their lives to Jesus, uh, they began to fully understand. And then they began to grow in faith. But it wasn't until that personal encounter with the risen Lord that they could take steps and grow in faith. And so then the angel said, remember how he spoke to you. And we know that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. We know that Jesus said that after he left, he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Now you take that in the account here, but you also take the principle and the account of each one of our lives that the things that God would say, he would have to remind us of and that he would be speaking to each one of us as we would reflect and remember. Uh, that's a big way that God works in our lives is by reflecting on things and remembering things. You know, he shows us something and it takes however long before it finally sinks in to what the Lord has said to us or what the word is saying to us. And so often it's followed by certain experiences. You might say that flesh is put on the bones of experience and then suddenly become, there's a validation. Oh, that's what God meant when he said what he said. So, you know, don't think that you're different in that way um, because none of us are. We see the testimony of Scripture. So oftentimes, you know, we, uh, we learn things the hard way, although we can learn things the easy way, and that would be take the word for face value or you might say faith value for what it says and believe it. I heard a, a Franklin Graham on the radio just this morning would uh, say that his dad was an advocate who believed the word of God. He believed what it said. He says that he didn't, he didn't always understand everything, but he believed everything. And I like that. I like that. I, and, uh, and so, and we know that it says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded, this is Hebrews 12, surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the, sh the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. And so, you know, sometimes many of the things that we struggle with are not sin in and of themselves, but they weigh us down. And so when we consider all that Jesus did sacrifice on our behalf, that takes the, the weight off of us, and we keep focused the, the, on, on the fact that he, he sits at the right hand of the Father. He sits upon the throne of God. And so... Um, and so we trust him for that. And so, and so then in um, verse, uh, verse 8, it says there, and they remembered his words. And so at that point was the time when things just sort of came together. They remembered his words but there's still going to be some question marks. Yeah, I remember when he said that, but how does that work out? That's right. He did say that. And, uh, you know, I, for one, I don't think I'm alone 
I need things to jog my memory. And oftentimes, lessons learned, lessons forgot, lessons you're reminded of, and lessons, you know, repeated. Uh, all because we are human, uh, we're leaky vessels, we need to always be filled. Oftentimes, that's just with the understanding of the word of God, being reminded, oh, that's right, in God's timing, I love to remember the word he has given to me, where I would say, you know, um, now I get it. Um, I know that many, many times that the Lord has worked that way, continues to work that way. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, as one example, uh, as I would understand what a vision is to the, this day, was uh, by something like that, you know, when flesh was given to the bones of experience. And I remember... Uh, struggling early on as a believer back in 81, I think it was, whether, you know, drinking was something I should be doing as a believer. And I just felt like God was saying that it was uh, hindering for what he wanted to do in my life. And I remember, uh, you know, just going through that struggle. And then all of a sudden I had just thought in my mind and it had to be very, very quick, but it was detailed. I was sitting in an office and uh, I was counseling a couple that walked in. Now, at this point, I wasn't even in, in ministry at all, so I never even counseled anyone. But I'm sitting in this situation where I'm counseling this couple, and, and, and the wife begins to pour out her heart, this Christian couple, about her husband's drinking and how it's interfering with their lives, and it's a problem, and this and that. And, um, and then I remember giving the illustration, well, you know, I, I drink now and again, or... I have a little bit here. And then he stood up and he said, see, he's just like me. And he turned and walked away. And I remember the look on the wife's face. And she just dropped her head and she started to walk away. And I went, I just was shocked with this thought. And I knew it was from the Lord. And I said, okay, Lord, no more for me. And that was the last time I touched uh, beer since 1981 because I knew it was from the Lord. But the part where the flesh was put on the bones of experience was five years later now I'm actually counseling a couple. Now I'm involved with the ministry, and a couple walks in, and the wife starts pouring out her heart, and and uh, you know, and she, um, you know, tells tells about her husband and the things that are that are going on there. And then I said that I used to, you know, take the position that you know drinking was okay, and he stood up and said, "See, he's just like me." And they go, wait a minute, you misunderstood me. And this is what I meant. And they sat down, we talked it through, and they ended up actually moving from the area because of the influence of friends and how it was really hammering their relationship. And as I'm taking notes after the counseling appointment, I remembered five years earlier that God showed me that exact scene. And I started weeping, saying, Lord, you didn't have to do that. And he said he just wanted to show me what he can do with somebody willing to obey him. And so you might say that that was one of those situations, and um, now I know what a vision is. I mean, for me, it was a picture in my head that God gave me, and it was clear, and, and it was going to happen. And so, and so like that, you know, I remember his words to me. Then they returned, uh, they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven, and to all the rest. And so there was more than the 11. We know that the ascension, there was 500 witnesses to the ascension. But, but these women were among the faithful followers of Jesus. Suddenly, at some point, things began to click. And the words of Jesus became real. And... Um, and it happened just as Jesus said it would. And he was raised from the grave. And so the angel tells them to tell the disciples what had happened. And um, the women obeyed. And they, they hurry back. And it's interesting because, um, you know, uh, it says that Mary, she gets there. And um, she tells the disciples and, uh, and, then, and then apparently the other women catch up. And so, um, so Mary goes, he, she passes on the word, and the disciples are in hiding, and they're bewildered. 
and um, and then you know here they come with the word, and so you know uh, I thought uh, for sure, you know we can, we get that way at times where we get bewildered. We thought I thought for sure this is what God was going to do, and it didn't happen. You know, for sure, this is what God showed me, and then it didn't happen. And so this is where the disciples were. This is why Peter went from being bold to den denying the Lord, because it didn't happen the way he had it planned. And so, um, and so there, there really was that hopelessness. But now there is hope. And also, we know uh, from the scriptures that with God, all things are possible. So if we ever catch ourselves in a place where I thought God was going to work this way, and he doesn't work that way. Well, in the same way, God can impact our, you know, in the same manner, resurrect us from that place of hopelessness. And that's a principle there. And so, uh, what does it take? Believing in the promises. And in this case, believing in the promises of something he's already shown us. He's already shown us, but yet we've not accepted the promises. So we get in this place where we think, oh, I thought, God, you were going to do this. And he's already given us his promises, but we just don't believe him. And that's what had happened. And so once they did, it changed everything. And so this was um, where the women found the disciples. It was Mary Magdalene. Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women uh, with them, who told these things to the apostles, and their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. And so they were discouraged. Now, Mary Magdalene, I have to make special mention, that she was the one that Jesus cast out seven demons from her. You know, and so all the Gospels place Mary Magdalene at the cross and also at the tomb. And also, she was the first one that had the privilege of encountering the risen Lord. What an amazing testimony. As he reminds me, that this is none of this by coincidence. This is the act of God Almighty that these things would unfold just like they did. It reminds me of the words of Jesus. He says, he who is forgiven much loves much. And when you consider Mary Magdalene, you think that she would be truly thankful? I would think so. What she was delivered from, and then this, well, this is the account of Scripture. She was impacted in that way, you know, not deserving of anything, rejoicing in what Jesus had done for her life. And, um, and her testimony reveals her loving devotion because of what Jesus Christ did in her life. And yet, every believer is no different than that very bit of forgiveness that she received, we receive. We have been delivered no lesser degree than Mary Magdalene. In no lesser way should we show our love and, and appreciation to be faithfully following Jesus, our Lord. Joanna, she was uh, shown to be a faithful follower, and Mary also, and the other women. And so here were these women. And if you understand the, the culture of the time, you would think, hey, what, you know, why are women given that first mention? Why are women here leading the way? And uh, shouldn't the first mention be given to men? Well, apparently God didn't think so. And I, I find it interesting because this is only another proof of divine inspiration of Scripture. Uh, that it wasn't man that was writing this. This is God writing this because this would be completely abstract to the way man would give this account. The fact that the message was carried by women gives further credibility and persuasiveness to the truth of Luke's account and the gospel accounts, because no ancient person would make up such a story that they would have women as the official witnesses leading the way. As a matter of fact, the Jewish people believed that a woman could not be a credible witness. 
That was the belief that they had. And so if men were the inspirers of Scripture, the ones behind the writing of Scripture, they would have painted themselves in a completely different way. And their heroes, they would have hid the sin of their heroes, which the Bible never does. They would have conveniently left out those things. Often like those who misrepresent the gospel that present the social gospel, those who give the message, uh, the pro, pro, you know, prosperity teachers that will tell you that, uh, that if you're not wealthy, it's because of sin in your life or you don't have any faith or if you're sick, it's because you have sin in your life and all these kinds of things because they're making merchandise of people. This is when men are the inspirers of the things that are said. And so they seem to them as idle tales, these things that are said. Jesus later rebuked them in, in Mark uh, 16, 14. It says, later he, Jesus, appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. So he rebuked them because the testimony of those who they trusted and knew and were his disciples. So he rebuked them for that. And then, and then also um, in just verses 25 and 26 of this chapter where it says, and he said to them, O foolish ones, this is to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures of the things concerning himself. So he rebuked them also because of the, the documentation of the word, the prophetic word, what the prophets had spoken. It was all there. And so, you know, that's also a reminder to us of the times we live in. The prophets spoke of these things happening. The prophets gave us a picture of the way things would line up globally in the world and all these things. And so we have no excuse to be caught sleeping, um, but we are, are told to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We're instructed to make sure we have our lamps full and be ready for the coming of the Lord. There's no excuse for that. When the Lord comes, will he find faith on the earth is another uh, scripture. And so we're challenged to trust the Lord. And, uh, and, then in, um, and then in this last verse, verse 12, but Peter, hearing these things, arose and ran to the tomb. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. And so uh, Peter, like so many skeptics um, that have tried oftentimes to disprove that there was a resurrection. Um, they would say that uh, the story was made up and the disciples uh, made up the story. But if you look at the account, the opposite occurs to that idea. The disciples were not anxiously looking for any reason to believe that Jesus had risen. As a matter of fact, they were not anticipating it at all. And so when told of the resurrection, they refused to believe it without concrete evidence. Even a missing body was not enough, not enough evidence. And so that disproves that whole idea. And then also the fact that when Peter looks in, it says that he saw his linen lying uh, uh, lying by themselves. And so when he looked in, John's gospel tells us he saw the strips of linen lying there and Jesus, the, the part that covered his head was folded up and separated uh, from the rest of the grave cloths. So this, uh, so it was, in a, in a sense, it wasn't something done hastily. And uh, the, the word used for the linen cloths being folded is actually a Greek word that could be spoken of as rolled up. And so what is understood, it's almost like as if Jesus passed through his wrappings, his grave cloths, and uh, dismissing the idea of a grave robber. 
The neatness and order was an indication that there was not a hasty removal of the body of Jesus. And so no wonder Peter goes away pondering what and perplexed and marveling because in his mind rings the, with the women what Mary Magdalene said, what? We don't, they took his body and we don't know where he put it. And Peter looks in there and think, well, that's odd. Would the robbers take and fold up his headpiece and then unwrap his body or put it back in a place where it looked like Jesus passed through it? I don't think so. The scriptures tells us that John looked in there and he believed. He, John right away had insight to believe, but John also has a sensitivity in a relationship to Jesus, knowing that he's the one that, you know, leaned on the breast of Jesus. He was the one at the cross, the only one of the 12 that was at the cross. So there was a sensitivity there, which makes sense that there would also be revelation there in the heart of John to receive all that he had seen. And so Peter was perplexed. He marveled to himself what happened. He uh, also, being a fisherman, probably thought something's fishy here. And, um, and so, but Jesus clarified this. He said this, Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And so, the gospel is the good news. And... Um, it is the way of salvation singularly. And Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. And so this morning, do you wonder about these things? Or you, do you rejoice in these things? And, you know, why is there the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Why is his resurrection so important? Because without it, you know, we would not have hope that we have now. Hope would be dead, non-existent, with nowhere else to turn. I think about uh, when many were leaving Jesus because of the hard things that he was saying. Many left. And then he turned to the disciples and he said, are you going to leave too? And Peter turned to him and said, where would we go? You're the ones with the, we're the one with the word to eternal life. Where would we go? Where would we turn? But because it is true, we have hope of eternal life when we encounter the risen Lord. And so, as we look around today and the things that we're experiencing, I can understand the fear factor of dying. When people do not know Jesus Christ. I can understand that. That makes sense to me. But for Christians, oh my goodness. Really? Jesus is Lord. He defeated death and passes on to us the blessing. Amen? Let's pray. So Lord, um, I want to thank you for your word. I pray for all those out there that, uh, that have been tuning in. I pray, Lord, if any has not made that commitment to you that right now they would look to you, that, that they would, that they would uh, believe the empty tomb and that they would understand that you died, that you shed your blood for their sins and the only way that they could be forgiven is to receiving, receiving that great salvation, receiving you as Lord and Savior. And I pray that all that are watching would make that decision to follow you and to serve you, to ask for forgiveness, knowing, Lord, that, um, that you're the great deliverer, that you defeated that last enemy of death, and we need to fear death no more, but we rejoice in the empty tomb, we rejoice in the resurrection, we rejoice in your soon coming, we rejoice in heaven where we're going to spend eternity I thank you for that hope that we can have now and experience right now while we're here living this life that you've blessed us with as well. So thank you for this great day and that all that it signifies in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.